Ryszard Kuklinski, codenamed Jack Strong, a Polish and American hero, helped the United States defeat Soviet Russia. In Moscow, he obtained top secret plans for Red Army aggression in Europe. He prevented the outbreak of the Third World War, in which Poland was to have become a nuclear wasteland, and Polish soldiers cannon fodder for the Russian marshals. Sentenced to death by the communists, he was exonerated by Free Poland. His life and activities in the year 1971 to 1981 represent the most important intelligence mission of the Cold War. Measured by political and military consequences, he was the most important US intelligence agent of the 20th century. Colonel Kuklinski, posthumously promoted to general, risked his life and the lives of his family by making difficult decisions. He was possessed not only of military courage, but also ordinary civil courage too. In Moscow, he gained possession of strategic plans for Soviet aggression towards Western Europe and NATO states, which he then handed to the Americans. These were in fact the plans for the unleashing of a third world war by the evil communist empire. By providing these plans to the Americans, General Kuklinski helped the United States to win the Cold War. This has been confirmed not only by the political, military and intelligence authorities of the United States, but also by Soviet marshals and generals. For the Poles, a Third World War would have been a catastrophe, regardless of its outcome. General Kuklinski, head of the Strategic Defense Planning Department of the General Staff of the Polish Army, was also the secretary of the Polish delegation to meetings of the Warsaw Pact, as well as the liaison officer between Red Army Command and the Polish People's Army. Ryszard Kuklinski said, The efforts of the United States meant that the world avoided a nuclear holocaust, which Moscow included in its strategic plans. The knowledge of what would happen should war begin was overwhelming. For years I had been sticking little mushroom symbols on the huge staff maps signifying nuclear explosions. Blue for the bombs to come from the west, red where ours were supposed to land. There is no doubt that Kuklinski broke his military oath of obedience to the Red Army and the Warsaw Pact. He was spurred to this course of action by the events of December 1970, when unarmed civilians were killed by regular Polish army units, representing Soviet and communist domination. This followed Warsaw Pact aggression in Czechoslovakia in 1968 and the presence of Soviet nuclear weapons on Polish territory. From the very beginning of his struggle, Kuklinski was opposed to Poland's enslavement by the Soviet Union after the Second World War's end in 1944. The fight for Poland's independence after World War II. Jan Jarin, historian. From the perspective of Polish military and political aims, the Second World War ended in disaster for Poland and the Poles. Since we did not regain our independence, the Polish nation was among those that suffered the most from the war and could not rejoice in full liberation. This was primarily the result of the policy of the Soviet Union, which led to Soviet armies entering Polish territory, liquidating the structures of the Polish underground state and arresting its military and civilian leaders. They installed communists and non-Polish but Polish-speaking authorities in the territory of the future post-war Polish state. A key moment in this process, underway since 1944, was the Yalta Conference in February 1945. It took place after several very important events in Poland. Firstly, in the so-called Lublin region of Poland, the Soviet authorities had installed the PKWN, the Polish National Liberation Committee, as a communist government. This was transformed on the 1st of January 1945 into the provisional government. It consisted almost entirely of communists and hangers-on and was recognized solely by Moscow authorities in the region of Lublin, 
Polski Lubelski. A second very important event was the failure of the Warsaw Uprising in October 1944. This had far-reaching consequences. It was a significantly easier task for the Soviet Union to deal with the remaining Home Army leadership and the remnants of the civilian structures of the Polish underground state. The Germans, while murdering Warsaw and the leaders and soldiers of the Home Army throughout the entire war, up to and including 1944, assisted the Soviets in the dismantling and destruction of the Polish state, which had endured underground. The result was the decision of the last commander of the Home Army on the 19th of January 1945 to disband it. But General Leopold Okolicki, codenamed Nizwiadek, Bear Cub, commander of the Polish underground armed forces, did not liquidate the Home Army, he disbanded it. The objectives were to remain the same, that is, the officers and soldiers not captured by the Red Army, the NKVD, or any other formations accompanying the Soviet invasion of Polish lands, were to continue to resist, to keep fighting until the ultimate goal, the liberation of Poland, was achieved. Yalta represented a very important and tragic moment on the road to independence. It was in Yalta in February 1945 that the Americans and British agreed that the communist provisional government was to become the foundation on which the future provisional government of national unity would be built, with the aim of allowing free and democratic elections. This Yalta provision gave the Soviet Union an obvious advantage when dictating terms for Poland's territories. The communists became the only government authorized to operate within the Polish lands, which allowed the Soviet Union to liquidate the structures of the legal Polish state. In March 1945, 16 Polish leaders were arrested and transported to Moscow for a political show trial. As a result of the formation of the Provisional Government of National Unity at the end of 1945, the fragile structures of the Polish underground state, the Council of National Unity, and the government delegation for Poland decided to disband. Despite the arbitrary actions of the Soviet Union with respect to Polish underground independent structures, both military and civilian, from the Polish perspective, the war continued. In early July 1945, just after the formation of the Provisional Government of National Unity in June, France, Great Britain, the United States, Italy, and all of the most important world powers withdrew their recognition of the Polish government in exile, the only legal government that truly represented Polish interests. It was this government, throughout the years of wartime occupation, which was the representative of the fundamental objective, the restoration of Poland's independence. The government in exile continued to feel obliged to maintain contact with the country, to maintain contact with those structures that would continue the work of the Polish underground state, begun during the German and Soviet occupation. This successive devastating blow is key to understanding the context of Poland's situation after the Second World War. This was the background against which we built the framework for the independence underground's functioning after the Second World War. The phenomenon of the Polish independence underground is unlike any other in the history of Europe, or even the world. 
As I have mentioned, as a result of the disbandment of the Home Army in January 1945 by General Okolitsky, the central structure, all the regional structures, military units and their subsidiaries within the Home Army continue to function, despite never-ending NKVD repression. To continue the conspiracy, General Okolitsky tried to create a new organization called Nie, short for Niepodległość, independence, and also meaning no. The head of this organization was General August Emil Fieldorf, code name Nil. Tragically, both commanders, Okolitsky and Fieldorf, were arrested in the first months of 1945. Now the danger existed that the continuity of command within the armed resistance would be broken. Consequently, in May 1945, at the end of the Second World War in Europe, General Władysław Anders, acting supreme commander in exile, decided to create the Armed Forces Delegation for Poland. To take command, Anders nominated the highest-ranking officer remaining at large. This was a colonel of the Home Army High Command, who had been head of the Information and Propaganda Office, Jan Zepetsky. The Armed Forces Delegation for Poland was tasked with protecting those that remained underground from further repression and to maintain with them the hope that the fate of Poland was not yet cast. That the Americans and Great Britain would maintain diplomatic relations with the Polish government in exile. The situation changed diametrically in July 1945, as I have mentioned. The effect of these changes was the disbandment of the Armed Forces Delegation for Poland by Colonel Jan Zepetsky, who on the 2nd of September 1945 decided to form Wolność i Niezawisłość, Wien, Freedom and Independence. This association was the largest anti-communist resistance organization, being, in effect, the continuation of the Home Army as a consequence of the existence of the structures of the Polish underground state. These were the same structures, although not the same people, since a large part of them had obviously been arrested. Up until 1947, Wien had as many as 60,000 soldiers in its ranks, but the structure itself rested not in commands, but in boards, meaning that this was a political, not a military structure. Colonel Zepetsky would become President Zepetsky, later his successors, right up to the 4th General Council of Wien, headed by Colonel Łukasz Czaplinski, were also presidents and not commanders. In fact, Wien had both military and civilian aims. The military aims were the supervision and protection of all of those military, armed, partisan structures that continue to operate in the independence underground. On the other hand, political activities involved using propaganda to support Stanisław Mikołajczyk's PSL, Polish Peasants' Party, amongst others. Wien also carried out intelligence activities aimed at presenting the wrongs of the Soviet occupation taking place on Polish territory to the Polish government in exile and international public opinion. Wien's greatest intelligence achievement was the preparation of a 1946 memorandum to the UN. Obviously, it elicited no reaction, not from the Americans, not from the British, nor from any other world power. With the exception of the Holy See, there was no interest in risking anyone's relations with the Soviet Union. Another armed national underground organization, with structures also originating in the Home Army, but specifically from the nationalist camp, 
was the NZW, National Military Union, which between 1945 and 1947 would number approximately 30,000 officers and men. The political wing of the National Military Union was the Stronictvo Narodowe, National Party, who remained in hiding and were simultaneously very strongly represented in the Polish government in exile. Zygmunt Berezhovski, a National Party activist, was the Minister for Internal Affairs of the Polish government in exile, which continued despite being ignored by the superpowers. Berezovsky's duties included maintaining contact with the homeland, meaning his National Party friends in the underground. The aim of the National Party and the National Military Union was to await the armed conflict between the Americans and Great Britain against the Soviet Union. They counted on this conflict, the Third World War, to reactivate the issue of Poland, and then armed resistance would have proven to have a purpose. The third national underground organization was the NSZ, National Armed Forces. In the years 1944 to 1947, it numbered more or less 10,000 officers and men. When it was finally liquidated by the communists, the remnants of the NSZ joined the NZW. This organization also had its political patron, an extremely clandestine group operating deep underground, Organizacja Polska, the Polish organization. Although they had no direct relations with the Polish government in exile, they did create a very important courier route, known as Konrad's Road, leading to the army under General Władysław Anders in Italy. At least until December 1944, the Polish army in the West, under General Anders, was stationed in free European territory. The aim of the Polish organization and the NSZ was, among other things, to regain Polish independence by means of armed conflict. They hoped that France, Great Britain and the United States would not bear the infringements to human and citizens' rights perpetrated by the Soviet Union, and that tensions in international relations would rise to such an extent that the Polish question would require an answer from the West. Practically everyone who believed that Polish independence could be restored via force and politics lost. Those who stood at the heads of independence organizations with a nationwide reach likewise lost, because organizationally they persisted in the Polish underground state, just as those who, after 1945, created new regional organizational structures. Among these was a very important structure in Podhale, led by Józef Kuras, nom de guerre Ogien, fire. This army of Polish partisans was able to capture the prison in Kraków, a great city. This unit was so strong that at one point it numbered over 650 men. In 1945, equally strong structures covered Łódź, Radomsko and Częstochowa. This was the KWP, Underground Polish Army, a local organization, but very strong in this region. A similar case was Roak, Home Army Resistance Movement, and the 5th Home Army Vilno Brigade, led by Major Zygmunt Szenzelaj, codename Łupaszka posthumously promoted to colonel in 2016. The organizations of the Polish post-war independence underground were determined from the very beginning to resist totalitarian Soviet authority, the totalitarian communist regime. By 1955, about 250,000 Poles had passed through the gates of the prisons in communist Poland. A significant proportion of these were those that had fought, in one way or another, for the restoration of independence after the Second World War. Approximately 50,000 Poles fighting for independence died as a result of either post-war battles or courtroom verdicts. Despite such great losses, we can say that all of these cursed 
first soldiers, cursed by the communists, who are today also called the unbroken, did not lose touch with one another over subsequent generations. Even when the last cursed soldier's fortress fell, in the 1950s or 60s, clear structures of anti-communist resistance were emerging. In the 1960s, a movement appeared, and in the 1970s, further structures. Colonel, now General Ryszard Kuklinski, was one of those people who stood in this relay of generations between the cursed soldiers and Poland's restored independence. This was thanks to the cursed soldiers becoming a significant point of reference for young people growing up in the 1950s. This was under the great pressure of Sovietization. There were about 1,000 communist educational and academic organizations, including armed ones. And this youth, which had no connection with the Second World War, could see in the 1950s that communism was a system that was morally unacceptable for them. Consequently, they decided to continue to live and function in underground conditions. All of this tells us that the category of cursed soldiers, unbroken soldiers, is a category of people who had within them such an energy of Polishness that they became a point of reference for the majority of independence movements, for all those who wished for Poland to regain her independence and strove mightily for that end until 1989. The Polish struggle for independence was above all a struggle to preserve the Polish identity. One of the most obvious conditions for Poles to remain Polish was to uphold the Catholic Christian faith. Consequently, wherever the aim is an independent Poland, there are priests and there is the church. Neither the Polish underground state, nor the home army, nor the later post-war independence underground would have existed without the strong moral connection to priests and military chaplains. In the case of the Second World War, military chaplains were present in the Home Army, in the NSZ, and they remained with those soldiers after 1945. Many of these clergy found themselves in Stalinist prisons because of this. We have calculated that from 1945 to 1955, about 1,000 priests were either in or passed through Stalinist prisons, about 10% of the entire clergy. Many priests were sentenced to death, such as Father Władysław Gurgacz, or to long periods of imprisonment. They died alongside the cursed soldiers because they were alongside them both in times of triumph and of disaster. At funerals, at clandestine burials, in joyous moments during field masses, administering Holy Communion or celebrating Holy Mass. This was something very obvious for the independence underground, this very strong connection between the church and the cause that kept them hidden in the forests, the cause of restoring Polish independence. General Ryszard Kuklinski, over nine years, passed confidential documents to the US belonging to Poland's occupier and the enemy of the free world, Soviet Russia. He wrote himself into the history of the post-war struggle for an independent Poland. Those of the cursed soldiers who lived into the 1990s called him the last Polish cursed soldier. He was accepted into the fellowship of the political prisoners of communist Poland sentenced to death, 
In assisting the U.S. defeat, the Soviet Union, by revealing the latter's plans for an assault on the West, he fulfilled the testament of the Polish independence underground from the period immediately after the Second World War.